The governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria is about to hold a post-bankers committee press briefing to unveil new initiatives to boost the Nigerian economy. We now cross live to Abuja for the event. We did this press briefing today <clears throat> uh, because it was thought fit that the main kernel of the discussions at today's bankers committee which borders on how to deepen the Nigeria's um, banking system, broaden the base of the Nigerian economy through non-oil export stimulation, that the press briefing on this subject should be led by, by me. So ladies and gentlemen, let me say good afternoon and welcome to the Central Bank of Nigeria. I have decided to personally lead this press briefing today following a 364th Bankers Committee meeting which just ended in order to give you updates on recent economic developments and provide you with factual updates about the positive outcomes of the various intervention programs we introduced at the onset of COVID-19 and our new initiatives in Nigeria's foreign exchange market. We also intend to update everyone about the decisions we have taken to ensure that we continue to strive to attain our mandates as set out in the CBN Act of 2007. In order to do so, let me first give you a brief background and context of our decisions today. Prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Nigerian economy was in a positive growth trajectory. We had witnessed 12 consecutive quarters of positive growth, along with significant foreign capital inflows into the country due to improved fundamentals of the Nigerian economy. Unfortunately, the onset of, of the pandemic caused unprecedented social and economic consequences across the world. The rapid spread of COVID, coupled with drastic measures taken by fiscal and monetary authorities to stabilize their respective economies all over the world, has certainly changed the world as we know it today. In Nigeria, its impact was evident through several channels. First, the virus constituted a challenge to public health given its contagion, contagious nature and measures had to be taken to contain the spread of the virus. This included social distancing and movement restrictions while efforts were taken to build the capacity of our healthcare institutions to respond adequately to the virus. On the economic front, we witnessed four major discernible outcomes, namely First, there was a sharp deceleration and sometimes complete stoppage in global economic activities that significantly reduced the demand for and price of crude oil, Nigeria's main earner of US dollars. Indeed, prices fell by more than 70% and as of 20th of April 2020, the price of crude oil fell below zero dollar per barrel as producers were forced to pay buyers for overwhelmed storage facilities. Second, given that no one knew the depth of, of or duration of the pandemic, many foreign investors withdrew massive amounts of funds from emerging markets. Investors withdrew over $100 billion in emerging market portfolio equity and roughly $20 billion in emerging market portfolio bonds in the wake of the pandemic. And thirdly, that's why remittances fell significantly. This is understandable because to the extent that COVID-19 led to significant job losses in many advanced economies, that's why remittances also suffered commensurate reduction. In inflows into Nigeria, all these factors jointly explain the heightened pressure on the currencies of major emerging market countries, including Nigeria. The final challenge we faced as a country was major disruptions in global supply chains as countries sought to ensure that they had sufficient essential materials for their local market relative to their export market. We witnessed 
countries like India, Vietnam, and China put in place restrictions on export of food and drug items. Expectedly, these difficulties led to a contraction of the GDP and an uptick in inflation in 2020, with inflation, with inflation exacerbated by the increase in VAT rate, exchange rate adjustment, and seasonal food supply shocks due to the onset of the farming season and other structural bottlenecks. Faced with these challenges, the Central Bank of Nigeria had to contend with balancing the need to increase spending to support the economy with additional measures to prevent an undue spike in inflation and heightened pressure on our exchange rate. After a careful analysis, we decided to support growth by taking unprecedented measures to prevent the economy from going into a tailspin. Our first objective was to restore stability to the economy by providing assistance to individual households, SMEs, and businesses that had been severely affected by the pandemic as well as by the lockdown measures. Some of the measures include A, the one-year one year extension of moratorium on principal repayments for CBN interventions, B, reduction in NPR from 12 to 11 percent, 12.5 to 11.5, a reduction of interest rate for civil intervention loans from 9 to 5, creation of 300 billion naira targeted credit facility for affected households and small businesses, creation of a 100 billion intervention fund in loans to pharmaceutical companies and healthcare practitioners, F, a creation of a research fund which is designed to support development of vaccines in Nigeria, G, the creation of a one trillion naira facility in loans to boost local manufacturing and production across critical sectors, and H, introduction of policies and programs to boost diaspora remittances. Ladies and gentlemen, to date, the CBN, working with our deposit money banks and participating financial institutions, has granted over three trillion naira in intervention loans that have undoubtedly been one of the critical ingredients for our economic recovery and employment generation. Specifically, under the Anchor Boras program, we have disbursed 948 billion to 4.78 million smallholder farmers who cultivated 5.2 million hectares of farmlands across the country, thereby creating 12.5 million direct and indirect jobs. Under our targeted credit facility, which was meant to help boost help households and businesses that suffered significant losses during the pandemic. We have disposed 368.79 billion naira to 778,000 beneficiaries, comprising 648,052 households and about 130,000 SME businesses. We have also disbursed 1.45 trillion naira to 337 large real sector projects in agriculture, manufacturing, services, and mining under our real sector support facility. In healthcare, 122 major healthcare projects have been funded to the tune of 115.36 billion. These healthcare interventions went to 31 pharmaceutical and 91 hospital projects. These interventions help to support acquisition of 59 magnetic resonance imaging scanners MRI, 42 computer tomography CT scanners, and four oncology screening machines. For the AxMix program, which caters for small and medium enterprises in the agribusiness space, a total of 134.63 billion naira has been released to 37,571 SME projects, out of which 67% were directly in agriculture-related projects, 22.5% were in services, while the balance were in fashion, IT, and related subsectors. Under the Nigerian Electricity Stabilization Facility, a total of 229 billion naira has been disbursed to nine discos to help cover their financial obligation to upstream market participants. These interventions have helped in significantly improving liquidity in their ecosystem and increased electricity generation from 4,000 megawatts in 2020 to over 5,000 megawatts in 2021. The bank has also released 47.8 billion naira to 810 discos 
under the National Mass Metering Program for the procurement of 858,026 electricity meters. Because of this disbursement, the revenue collection for this course increased significantly to over 69 billion naira as of December 2021. It is important that I, I went through these numbers painstakingly to show that the problems we faced as a nation do have solutions as long as we work objectively to understand them and dispassionately to solve them. It is obvious from the foregoing that the impact of these measures helps the country make the fastest recovery from recession ever recorded and change the trajectory of inflation to an eight-month downward spiral. These policies and measures also helped to a significant improvement in diaspora inflows from an average of $6 million per week in December 2020 to an average of over $100 million per week in this January 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, with these results and having impact on these for two years, the CBI will be reviewing these intervention programs going forward to ensure that they continue to achieve the desired results. Indeed, the lessons we have learned from this crisis have been invaluable in helping us with serious introspection with a view to finding long-lasting and homegrown solutions to these perennial problems. Although interest rates on our various intervention facilities were expected to revert to 9% effective March 1, 2022, we are announcing that the rates will remain at 5% for another year in view of the promising trajectory we have established in economic growth and job creation. In effect, the concessionary interest rate of 5% on our intervention facilities would now be extended until March 1, 2023. As regards the foreign exchange markets, for example, on the inadequacy of FX supply and constant pressure on the exchange rate. We believe that the lessons we have learned from our policies on remittances can be applied in improving some aspects of our FX inflow into the country. As we know, there are four major sources of FX inflow into Nigeria. These are, one, proceeds from crude oil exports. Two, proceeds from non-oil exports. Three, diaspora remittances. And four, foreign direct or portfolio investments. As I've explained above, all these sources were adversely affected by COVID-19. In addition, most of them are unreliable sources that are perennially prone to exogenous vicissitudes of global economic development. For example, we have all been witnesses to the ever-changing fortunes of oil exporting countries. Even those that have been reputed to manage their oil proceeds well also suffer from major shocks once oil prices plummet. In order to avoid these sudden adjustments to our economic life, we need to focus as a nation on strategies that can help us earn more stable and sustainable foreign exchange inflows into our country. We would need to follow the best practices of other countries and ensure that we protect ourselves a little bit from factors that are beyond our controls. After a careful consideration of the available options and a wide consultation with the banking community, the CBN is effective immediately announcing the Bankers Committee's RT200 FX program, which stands for the race to $200 billion in FX repatriation into Nigeria. The RT200 FX program is a set of policies, plans, and programs for non-oil exports that will enable us attain a lofty yet attainable goal of $200 billion in FX repatriation exclusively from non-oil exports over the next three to five years. And we are optimistic that this can be achieved. 
The RT200 program will have the following five key anchors. One, value adding export facility. Two, non-oil commodities expansion facility. Three, non-oil FX rebate scheme. Four, dedicated non-oil export terminal. And five, biannual, biannual non-oil export summit. Let me briefly describe each of these anchors. The value adding export facility will provide concessionary and long-term funding for business people who are interested in expanding existing plants or building brand new ones for the sole purpose of adding significant value to our non-oil commodities before exporting same abroad. This is important. Because the export of primary unprocessed commodities does not yield much in foreign exchange. In Nigeria today, we produce about 770,000 metric tons of sesame seed, cashew, and cocoa. Of this number, about 12,000 metric tons are consumed locally and 758,000 metric tons are exported. The unfortunate thing, though, is that out of the 758,000 metric tons that are exported annually, only 16.8% is processed. The rest are exported as raw sesame, raw cashew, and raw cocoa, thereby giving Nigerian farmers an infinitesimal part of the value chain in these products. For example, the global chocolate industry is valued at about $130 billion. Of this amount, Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, and Nigeria account for more than 72% of global cocoa exports. Yet, because we mainly export raw cocoa beans, Côte d'Ivoire gets, or earns, $3.6 billion annually. Ghana generates $1.9 billion annually. And Nigeria generates about $800 million annually from an industry that is worth over $130 billion. In contrast to West African countries, Belgium accounted for 11% of global chocolate exports in 2019 at a value of $3.16 billion. Similarly, Germany, Germ Germany's chocolate export were worth $5.14 billion in the same year. These numbers are the same for other commodities as well. Therefore, given these alarming disparities between exporters of raw commodities and exporters of semi-finished or finished products, we believe that the value-adding export facility is a first step to getting back some of this foreign exchange that we rightly deserve. Indeed, we expect that this facility will also accommodate the demand of our youth population who are already adding value in using e-commerce and online methods for the provision and export of software, financial services, financial technology, Nigerian fashion and attires, and the likes. As long as these exports are captured with from NXP and the FX process are repatriated and verifiable by the CBN, we will accommodate such businesses under this facility. The second facility we announced is the non-oil commodities expansion facility. This facility will also be a concessionary facility designed to significantly boost local production of exportable commodities. This facility will be designed to ensure that expanded and new factories that are financed by the value-adding facility are not starved of inputs of raw commodities in their production cycle. A massive boost in the production of such commodities will also help dampen and moderate the prices of these commodities so that the expected increase in demand for them does not become a pressure point for aggregate prices in the market. In order to maximize the potentials and impact of this facility, 
we will replicate what other successful export-based economies have done by first prioritizing and targeting certain commodities. We will create a geographic prioritization of crops across the country to achieve production efficiencies through the development of special areas that will cater to specific commodities. Since sustainable foreign exchange earnings are dependent on national competitive advantage, a prioritization framework based on crops which Nigeria is best suited to produce will be essential. Today, we are also announcing the introduction of the non-oil FX rebate scheme, a special local currency rebate scheme for non-oil exporters of semi-finished and finished produce who show verifiable evidence of export proceeds repatriation sold directly into the INE window to boost liquidity in the market. Analogous to the Naira for Dollar scheme, which has helped boost remittances from only $6 million per week to over $100 million per week, we shall establish the modalities for granting a rebate for each dollar that non-oil export proceeds that an exporter sells into the market for the benefit of other FX users and not for funding their own operations. Although this rebate program is with immediate effect, the detailed guidelines of this scheme will be communicated latest next week. Our plan is to graduate the percentage of the rebates depending on the level of value addition into the product being exported and for which FX is repatriated into Nigeria. In recognition of the perennial problems of port congestion cited by the exporters as a major impediment to improved operations and foreign exchange earnings, we have designed a third anchor of the RT200 program, which is this construction and establishment of a dedicated non-oil export terminal According to the Afri African Center for Supply Chain Practitioners, Nigeria loses about $14.2 billion annually due to congestion at our ports. Paraphrasing from an article by the Financial Times in December 2020, the congestion has become so bad that while it cost $3,500 to ship a 40 feet container from China to Lagos, which is a distance of 22,000 kilometers, it costs $4,000 to move the same container from the port to mainland Lagos, a distance of only 12 kilometers. During our stakeholder engagement with the various segments of exporters, we heard several heartbreaking accounts of how containers spent several months in the ports just waiting to be shipped, resulting in loss of perishable goods or well-established foreign customers. If we are to reach our goal, if we are to attain our goal of $200 billion in non-oil exports, then we can neither ignore nor wish away this problem. We must confront it head on and provide a solution. That is the reason we are today throwing a challenge to all state governments that have existing ports and are willing to partner with the Bankers Committee to establish not only a dedicated export terminal, but also the entire ecosystem of a world-class infrastructure needed for non-oil exports out of Nigeria. Over the next three months, Bankers Committee will be collecting and analyzing detailed proposals from interested state governments in order to decide which one we could partner with. The Bankers Committee will be arranging a significant part of the financing that will be needed for this port while the selected state governments will have responsibilities that will be spelled out in due course. What we are saying here, we will be approaching state governors that have port facilities or want to build port facilities because we are determined to set up dedicated export terminals in the country. Yes, seaport, and also we're also aware that some dedicated airport terminals are also being built. We would like to partner with them, but we're not going to limit it to just one. 
we would like to see those terminals compete to themselves. So we are looking at not less than two, about two or so, or three, so that they can compete. Because we must ensure that we must ensure zero tolerance, zero, zero tolerance for export of items out of the country, whether they are perishable or non-perishable. We believe that this dedicated port will be capable of creating over 100,000 direct and indirect jobs and will provide a huge boost to our quest for significant improvement in non-oil export earnings in Nigeria. Let me emphasize that under this arrangement, loans to companies wishing to expand or build new plants that will generate verifiable export proceeds for the economy shall remain at 5% per annum for 10 years loan, inclusive of two years moratorium. In recognition of the lessons we have learned from our rounds of consultation with ex non-oil exporters, we believe that a more formal, predetermined, and regular forum will be necessary to discuss the issues, challenges, and opportunities in this segment of the economy. That is the reason today we are announcing the introduction of a biannual non-oil export summit, the first of which will be organized during the first week of April 2022. This summit will bring together all the relevant stakeholders in the export business, including bankers, customs officials, Nigerian Ports Authority, the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, clearing agents, cargo airlines, shipping lines, logistic companies, insurance practitioners, and etc. This gathering will be one where for every complaint, problem or issue, challenge or difficulty that is presented or identified, there will be one or several agencies or practitioners that can articulate options for solving these problems. We believe that the ideas harnessed from such summit will be invaluable in helping us attain our ultimate goal of $200 billion in non-oil exports over the next three to five years. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm mindful that this goal itself may appear unattainable to some, but we are resolute and determined that we can achieve it. Many countries that are much less endowed than Nigeria are doing the same. Consider, for example, that agricultural exports alone from the Netherlands was about $120 billion last year. Yet, Netherlands has a land mass of about 42,000 square kilometers, which is much less smaller than the land mass of Niger State of Nigeria alone at over 76,000 square meters, square kilometers. In closing, let me note very importantly that the RT200 program is not intended to be a silver bullet to all our problems in the, in the export segment of the economy. Rather, it is a first step meant to ensure that the CBN is better able to carry out its mandate in an effective and efficient manner, which guarantees preservation of our scarce commonwealth and the stability of our national currency, the Naira. It is only by boosting productive and earnings capacity of this economy that we can truly, truly preserve the long-term value of our currency, the Naira, as well as the stability of our exchange rate. I believe that if our goals of attaining RT200 is achieved, I said in three to five years, hopefully 200 billion annually, then those who talk about floating the currency will throw a challenge to them and then we'll see what will happen to exchange rate in Nigeria if we free the market, if we float the currency and they will now start the battle for a stable exchange rate for Nigeria. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Governor. Uh, we'll take some questions now.
of the fact. Okay. Number one, your name and the media house you present. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Governor, and the members of your team. My name is Samir Michael Bogum, I'm the director of the Trust newspaper. I have a question and some concerns. First of all, I want to congratulate you for this new and bold initiative. I would like uh, clarifications. Uh, with this new initiative, are you now going to be paying less attention to the FPIs and, and rather drag this initiative, or you would have to drag it to a website by side? The second concern I have is uh, you are giving yourself a target of three to five years to pursue this IT200 initiative. And I'm wondering that uh, for the kind of value additions we, we need to see to, to drive in this FX, uh, we may have to look at capacity enhancement for most of these uh, companies to process in country. And that would also require bringing in facility for us. That also has implications for FX. Do we have a kind of uh, uh, FX, you know, pool that, that will be required to, to enable these companies, first of all, increase their capacity to process, to process in country uh, before thinking about any uh, additional income. And my final concern is uh, the type that is born out of your own comment from the support that you have provided other sectors. Recently, you were in Sokoto and you made an appeal, you know, to producers to try to bring down prices. Do you think that uh, with all of this encouragement, if this is done, it will not rob the local market of supply? With everybody now looking at uh, paying more from from efforts and all the incentives that you have put in place, what what are you going to do to ensure that local demand is adequately protected in all of this initiative to drive export? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Number two. Good afternoon, again. My name is Leah Kutimbala. I'm the comment here and I have just one question. Um, given the role banks are supposed to play in the actualization of this goal, how do you ensure that they truly key into the FX generation, the policy now, into the, the market, the foreign exchange market? Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Bowman. My name is Sarah Ike, Channel TV. Um, we saw that under the new export stimulation drive, exporters are expected to earn narrow rates for repatriated and FX. Um, under what terms and conditions will they earn rebates and how timely would that be? And then secondly, how does the new FX export regime accommodate those involved in online exports as well as sales from, from sales of products from abroad? Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Agon. My name is James Emeter with this day in uh, The incentives uh, that uh, you announced uh, appear to be concentrated on a finished uh, process and product. Uh, with the challenges also uh, in the raw material sector, uh, would, would you be considering that uh, segment also? Thank you. Members of the Bankers Committee, I am Nancy Nadi, the executive producer of the Bankers Committee. Uh, in light of the fact that uh, bad handling, poor handling, as well as um, poor warehousing infrastructure has resulted in our products being rejected when exported, are there plans really to improve the warehousing uh, infrastructure? That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I think um, I'd like to say that we are very happy that we got to this stage where we are saying that Nigeria cannot continue to depend for FX earnings to fund its import obligations from revenues coming from earnings from products where we cannot determine both price and quantity. Because what you will find is that until this time that for us to end export earnings we have to depend on what is the price of crude and what is the quantity of crude that we can we are allowed to export. 
let us not forget that before we found oil, Nigeria was meeting its FX obligations for to for to fund imported import items, right, from non-oil export sources. Here I'm talking about whether it is cocoa, whether it is granite, whether it is palm oil, whether it is rubber and, and the likes. But unfortunately, we we lost it completely when we found oil. And during those periods, when I say before we found oil, and maybe I need to be co corrected because I wasn't, I wasn't in the banking industry in the 50s and 60s, what was happening, I know, or I, I read, we read, <coughs> is that banks do not go to central bank for dollars. Banks naturally just buy, find proceeds and they fund these to fund their import obligation. But when we found oil, we decided that because there's no more non-oil proceeds, we have to go to central bank or NNPC to buy dollar to fund import obligation. And that took us to where we are today. So on the question as to whether or not um, it is not an intention to undermine earnings coming from the FPIs, let me say this. I read in my report that there are four sources through which we make we we generate earnings to fund our obligations, import obligations, through revenue from crude sales export, through um, revenue from um, FPIs or FDIs or F sales, through diaspora remittance and through exports. Unfortunately, unfortunately, more of our emphasis had to have always been on export earnings from crude and when we begin to, to sneeze, particularly when crude price drop, we now begin to resort to FPIs and FDIs. We are not saying that we will ignore them. They are our partners, we need them. However, we are saying that we cannot continue to um, put all our hopes as a country on where, how on earnings from a source that we cannot control. Or earnings from a source that comes in when things are good for us. But the moment things begin to, they begin to suspect that things are not good, or results are dropping, or there's some panic here and there, in fact, that is the time when we thought, we think we would have needed them. That is the time they want to run away. We cannot, as a country, depend on that alone. We will depend on it, but we will not. We should not, as a country, depend on that as a source from which we earn foreign exchange to fund our foreign exchange import obligation. We have to go back to the pre-oil period, where we funded our import obligation also from export earnings. And that is the reason we are saying that today the journey begins. That journey to, um, to re-establish ourselves, to, to, to find ourselves again saying, we will, we will work hard to boost our... Luckily, this country is endowed. Is it cocoa? Is it cashew? Is it tin and columbite? Anything. This country is endowed. And we are saying that certain things happened that made, them, made our, people, our people to abandon them. They talk about port congestion. They talk about different things rebates to support them, we are saying we will put this in place. We are saying for them to process them into semi-finished or finished goods that where they, there has been a lot of value addition that would have created employment that we will fund their obligation. We will fund them to acquire plants and equipment. We will fund them to open factories. For, a, for 10 years loan and two years moratorium, and indeed at 5%. That is the only way 
people can now be encouraged again. And they say, wow, I'm no, I'm no longer going to go to a bank and look for a loan to conduct an, a, 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 a manufacturing and productive activity that will result in export earnings and take the loan at 20 or 30 percent. That I can only, I can now go to a bank and benefit from an intervention facility at 5 percent. That will certainly reduce the cost of production. And that when I produce or process this product, as it were, and I conduct export, and I sell my export proceeds into the market, that I will get an FX rebate, Naira for dollar, that will encourage me to do more and do more. Gentlemen and ladies, I am optimistic, because if you look at it, if you go to a London market today, you go to a market in the US, you go to a market in South Africa, you find even our own granite, cleaned granite, right? You will find chinchin. They call it chinchin, right? You will find it in a store. You will find even our beans, because some one of our ex, one of the exporters gave some very very painful experience that he had to export our own. You see how they call black eyed beans yes. from Nigeria to India where it is processed. What does the processing entail? Grady to make sure they are from equal sizes, make sure there are no beetles inside it. You see weevils, you call it, you package it well. And then he now, ex that Indian exports it to London. He, I'll give you the price, right? He, he said he exports gr our green eye beans at, is it $1,200 to India. But from India, after it is graded, prepared and packaged, it is exported to London at $3,500. What a loss to a country. That is what we are seeing. That we should not allow a country to miss out from these brilliant opportunities. What does it do? This will create more jobs for our people. A lot of people can now go to farm. They can grow them. They earn money from it. Others will take it up from there. Logistic and transport it. Others will take it from there. Process it and export it and earn dollars. That is how to grow a country. That is how to grow an economy. That is how we can do things well for our country. And all of us will, will be happy that we are witnessing prosperity in our country. That's what we are saying. We are determined to do this, and that is why we are saying it is a journey that starts today. And we will need the cooperation and support of everybody to see to it that we achieve this goal. So it's not intended to say whether we are trying to say FPIs they are, are not important. Everybody is important. But we want to be sure that we are, we are in control of our destiny as a country. He says, do we have efforts to increase the processing in country. Listen, we have always said it, even under our 100 for 100 program, that or even some of our large scale um, Naira intervention programs for our real sector, that if you want to expand your plant, where even raw materials is essentially almost entirely available locally, you want to import your plant and machinery, we will give you all the foreign exchange you need to import the plant. Because we know that when we give you the foreign exchange to import the plant, it is probably going to be like one off. And after that, we now begin to generate that same effect that we use to import you. We generate, uh, generate exponential volume of that effort to fund other people's obligation. That is the idea. And that is why we seek everybody's support to embrace this. He says, the same tribune, trust, Will this export drive not rob local demand, rob of local demand for export of this? No. Yes, what you are saying is, if we well, are encouraging people to export, what happens to local, local market? No, it doesn't happen that way. As long as we remain focused, what this should do is to say it creates market opportunities for us. 
And how does that, how do we support that opportunity? We support that opportunity by saying, go and take a loan. Is it Anchor Borough Program loan? Is it a loan through the bank where we are importing plant and equipment? Is it all forms of loan? We have different types of intervention that you can benefit from. Whether you are a, a household, whether you are a micro, small and medium enterprise business, whether you are a large corporate, you can access a loan at 5% for 10 years with two years moratorium. I don't see how would that will rub off local market. Rather, it is meant to expand the, the economy and create economic activity that will grow our GDP. In fact, even also help our price stability mandate. So this is all an overall approach to broaden and diversify the base of the Nigerian economy. You said, given the roles banks are supposed to play in the actualization of this goal, how do you ensure that they truly will key into this policy? You know something? The banks don't have a choice. And I said so this morning in the meeting. I said, the era is coming to an end when you, because your customers need $100 million demand for foreign exchange or $200 million, you want to pack all the dollar and pass it to CBN to give you dollar. It is coming to an end because, and I've told them at the meeting, before or about latest end of this year, we will tell them, don't come to Central Bank for foreign exchange again. Go and generate your export revenue, export proceeds. Fund people who want to generate export proceeds. When those export proceeds come, we will fund them at 5% for you. Yeah? When those export proceeds come, they will end rebate. That's how we can help you. Then when those proceeds come, sell those proceeds to your customers that won $100 million or $200 million. But to say you will continue to come to Central Bank to give you dollar, we will stop it. We will stop it. So they don't have a choice because it is their bread and butter, right? <coughs> FX, import, export, funding else is another. It's their bread and butter. We are saying we will give it, pass it back to them, and they just have to work. Or maybe if they are lucky, we say, okay, you want to come to CBN? You will only come to CBN. Maybe we'll, when we see the record of export process you have generated, we say, okay, we'll give you 10% of it. We'll give you 5% of it. So what does that mean? You must go and join the race to build your foreign exchange from your export customers to generate FX to fund your import customers. That's all. And that's the best I can do to help them. I give them rebate. The best I can do to help them. I do intervention at 5%, 10 years, two years moratorium. Now, run your race for your profitability so that you can make your shareholders happy. That's all. Another person said um, about the rebate that you, um, that you saw that under the new export stimulation, exporters that earn Naira rebate for repatriated effect, under what terms? We will come up with um, a graduated format. If we find, and we're going to seek support of experts, if there is a very high value addition, high employment stimulating, pro, uh, that stimulates employment in that process, you will earn higher rebate than those who, whose uh, value addition is lower. The same way we are trying to say, as much as possible, we want to discourage rebates for um, uh, raw produce because we know from our studies that it has the capacity of creating inflation. Everybody, because they see there's going to be a rebate, everybody runs to the bush to buy cocoa at inflated prices. We don't want that. But rather, what we want from that um, downstream sector is that you can come and take a loan and say you want to expand your cocoa plantation. You want to expand your sesame plantation. You want to expand your cashew plantation and all that. We will, you will get a loan. You understand? But that rebate, we may not be able to look at that because 
for people to be saying so it means that maybe they're thinking we should uh, at this time we're saying no but we'll take a look at it but for now it is going to be for semi-processed and processed and wholly finished products um, also it talked about how do we intend to accommodate online export and sales out of Nigeria listen this is another opportunity for our young, our young bro brothers and sisters. You graduate from school. Yes, you are, it's good for you to wait for a, a job. But if the job is not coming, what's wrong with you? Going to, um, even do it, go into business of blending beans. Dry it up, package it, and export it. And you make money. You can get small loans at 5%. When you export, the dollar comes in, you earn export proceeds, right? That is for when you are talking about finished goods. Or you are into IT development, software development and sale. Yeah? You sit in your house, you build your software, and a company abroad says he wants to use your software. He pays you dollar for it, right? You sell the dollar into the market, <coughs> you earn your dollar, your naira, and you also earn a rebate for it. Oh, you are into fashion design. Your, your fashion brand is so nice that, that um, Neymar Marcos wants it. Oh, um, which are the stores again? I don't know them, you know. I, I mean, I mean, they ask for your brand. Online, you ship it. You earn dollar then you are also engaged. So you can see, it's meant for young people. If you are into creative industry, into movie, or into music, you can earn dollars. We were in a program about three, four years ago. Mr. Easy said for 400,000 pounds that uh, he invested in four ways, he got his 400,000 pounds back. And he started to earn more revenue on royalties for his music. If you sell the dollar into the market, we see it. We will give you your rebate and you make more money. So you see, this is a product that has accommodated everybody. Just let all food as leaves and be ready to work. Um, I think the last one Nancy says, how do we want to um, help to improve warehousing? Yeah. We also find in the course of uh, discussion with some of the exporters, that when they even <coughs> gather the goods or the produce, the process of handling, the process of storage, the process of warehousing results in the, the item being damaged and when they're eventually shipped, they get rejected and the process doesn't come in. Luckily again for us, we just repositioned and restructured Nigerian Commodity Exchange. They are going to have warehouses, first class warehouses, whether it is with the cooling facilities, everything, they will be there. There will be warehouse receipts. They will be operated properly, like typical exchanges. They can do storage for you, any, any fee for storage. And from there, you can export. And your export will be in line with the quality required. You don't run into the problem of reject abroad. That is what we want to do and we will seek everybody's cooperation to achieve this goal. I thank you all most sincerely for your time and good afternoon.